Father, we thank you tonight. We give you all the glory and honor. Thank you, Father, for your love for us that can never be quantified. Thank you for the provisions that you have made even from the beginning of the world. Thank you, Father, for the word of grace and the spirit of grace. Thank you, Father, for every time, every day, and for everything that you have done and that you will still do in our lives. We thank you for the cloud of glory under which you have brought us to function. Thank you for the revelations of the truth. Thank you for the light of the gospel. Father, we worship your holy name. Be thou exalted in Jesus' name. Tonight, we are looking unto you for instruction. We are looking unto you for guidance. We are looking unto you for encouragement, empowering, equipping, and strengthening. And Lord, we ask that by your spirit, you will reach out to everyone in Jesus' name. I pray that the spirit of God will take control. Holy Spirit, be free in this place. Establish the counsels of the Father in our life and glorify Jesus. We receive understanding of the truth. We receive revelation of your word like never before. We thank you, Father. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's be seated. I want to welcome you to the Bible study tonight. It's been a wonderful time. We thank God for the privilege to be here. Tonight we will continue in our series on the Sermon on Jesus on the Mount. And we are in chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6. We are still dealing with verse 12. We are still studying on the content of the Lord's Prayer. And we are learning how to pray accurately. Because basically, the Lord's Prayer is a prayer pattern. A prayer pattern to teach us how to pray accurately. It's not just a formula or a religious uh, recitation that we recite from time to time. But through the truths that Jesus gave us in the Lord's Prayer, he is teaching us how to pray effectively and how to pray accurately. Take note of those two words because as far as prayer is concerned, accuracy and effectiveness are very important. Because we will always pray. You will always pray. Yes or no? Until we see Jesus. You will always pray. Is there anybody who has prayed today? Have you prayed today? Will you pray before you sleep? Did you pray before you eat? Will you pray tomorrow? Will you pray day after tomorrow? You discover that as a believer, you cannot but pray. So if prayer is something we are going to do till Jesus come or till we go to be with the Lord, then anything that has to do with prayer accuracy and prayer effectiveness must concern us so that we will not be wasting time. We will be taking advantage of the power in prayer to reach out to God and receive his mercy and receive his help. So, we are still looking at the second part of the Lord's Prayer, which is about man and his needs. And you remember, I told you that there are three basic needs of man as revealed by the second part of the Lord's Prayer. The second part of the Lord's Prayer is Matthew chapter 6 from verse 11 to 13. The first part is Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 and 10. The first part talks about the glory of God, talks about God and his glory. You remember that. Then the second part talks about man and his needs. 
God has glory. Man has needs. And the truth is this, that there is no need that man has that the glory of God cannot take care of. So, but we are looking at the second part. And I told you that there are three basic needs of man on the earth. The first one is provision. That's what you see in verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. And then the second one is pardon. That was you see in verse 12. The one we are dealing with currently. And, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And then the third one is preservation or protection. And that's in verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So you discover that those three things are very important. We have spent time on the first need, which is provision. That was what I was talking about, praying accurately for the provision of daily need. And then we are on the second part, which is praying accurately for the forgiveness of sins. And that is, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. Amen. But in about two weeks ago, when we started the second part, I told you that there are two major truths that we must understand that will help us to pray accurately for the forgiveness of sin. The first one is, what is forgiveness of sin? What is forgiveness of sin? And then the second one is understanding sin itself. So about two weeks ago, we talked about forgiveness of sin, what, what the Bible means by forgiveness of sin, pardon and all that. And then last week, we spoke about sin itself. So today, I want to look at praying accurately for the forgiveness of sin from the standpoint of standing on the promises of God. Praying accurately for the forgiveness of sin. And under it, you can just write, standing on the promises of God. That's like a, a sub heading Standing on the promises of God. I want to look at how standing on the promises of God will help us to pray accurately for the forgiveness of sin. That's our business tonight. How standing on the promises of God will help us to pray accurately for the forgiveness of sin. Now, let me take it further. Every principle that I will be sharing tonight is not only going to be relevant for praying accurately for the forgiveness of sin, but it's going to be generally relevant for praying accurately for anything that you want to ask God for. I want you to understand this statement because it's going to help you. Though we are looking at praying accurately for the forgiveness of sin, looking at how standing on the promises of God can help us to pray accurately for the forgiveness of sin. But beyond that, generally, standing on the promises of God will not only help us to pray accurately for the forgiveness of sin, it will help us to pray accurately for anything that we're asking God for. In as much as we will need to pray regularly, so, every principle that I'm sharing tonight, although we help us to pray accurately for forgiveness of sin, but beyond that, it's a general principle that will help us to pray accurately for anything. For anything. There are principles that are relevant. Either you are praying for forgiveness of sin, either you are praying for provision Either you are praying for protection, either whatever you are praying for, these principles standing on the promises of God will help you to pray accurately. Did you get that now? 
so that you will not only be applying it to forgiveness of sin alone. Apply generally to your prayer life so that your prayer life can be more accurate and more effective. Now let's look at Matthew chapter 6 verse 12. I'm reading verse 12, verse 14, and verse 15. And forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. Verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now the first thing I want you to take note is this. That generally, when I say generally, I mean beyond forgiveness of sin. I mean general praying. Generally, prayer accuracy is a function of personal understanding of the promises and the provisions of God in the scriptures. That's the first thing I want you to know. Prayer accuracy is a function of your personal understanding of the promises and the provisions of God in the scriptures. When we say prayer accuracy, what do we mean? To pray the right way. To pray accuracy means to pray correctly. To pray correctly. So, praying correctly or pray, prayer accuracy is a function of your personal understanding of the promises and the provisions of God in the scriptures. But the mistake that people make is to go straight to pray without first of all understanding the promises and the provisions of the scripture. That's why most times they miss it in prayer. When you step into a supermarket and you want to buy something and then you ask them, do you have this? And they say, ah, we don't have. Can they give you what you have? Hello? Can they give you what you have? When you step into the supermarket, you want to buy something and you ask them, do you have this? And they see what you want to buy. Ah, they say, we don't have. Your shopping in that place is over. Because they don't have what you need. So staying around you will be an embarrassment. Insisting that they have to sell to you. They will conclude that something is wrong with you. In fact, before you know it, they will call security for you. Because they don't have what you need. The same thing when you come to God. Don't just go into prayer. First of all, have a personal understanding of the promises and the provisions of God in the scriptures. That is going to determine the accuracy of your prayers. You will know what to ask for and what not to ask for. You will know what is available and what is not available. Did you get that? So people, don't, people just go into prayer. They just start to pray. They just start to pray and just start to pray and just start to pray. And they're asking for things that provisions are not made for. They're asking for things that promises are not guaranteed. So, for your prayer to be accurate, either you are praying for forgiveness of sin, or you are praying for provision, or whatever you are praying for, you must have a personal understanding of the promises and the provisions of God in the scriptures. Did you get that now? Don't just go into prayers without finding out what is this prayer I want to pray. Is there a promise in scripture that guarantees this request? This prayer I want to pray, is there a provision in the scripture that gives me assurance that this thing is possible? So, first of all, understand Tell somebody, understand. Understand the promises and the provision of God in the scripture. Because that will determine your prayer accuracy. Either you are praying for forgiveness, you are praying for whatever. Number two, the revelation of the promises of God in the scripture determines three things. The revelation of the promises of God 
in the scripture determines three things. Did you get that now? Now, I'm talking, I'm not talking about just the promise of God. I'm talking about the revelation of the promise of God. Many people are quoting the promises of God, but they don't have a revelation of it. Many people are just mentally rehearsing the promises of God in their head. But they don't have a revelation of it. Hello, somebody. I want you to know the difference between knowing the promise of God and having a revelation of it. I want you to understand what I'm dealing with. Having, knowing the promises of God, being able to recite the promises of God, memorizing the promises of God, and having a personal revelation of it. If you don't have a revelation of the promises of God, the power of God available in that promise cannot flow into your life. It is your own revelation of that promise that connects your situation to the power in that promise. Beloved, every promise of God is like a capsule. How many of you have taken drug that is in capsule form before? Ampicillin, you know, amosacillin, and uh, all kinds of antibiotics that is in capsule form. Alright? You discover that the capsule itself as it, as, as it, uh, uh, it's, um, it, it has, the tablet has something that covered the powder inside. You get what I'm saying now? The powder inside is the real drug. But it is, it is contained in a capsule. So you need that capsule to assess the powder, the drug. Yes or no? So when you take the capsule, and then it goes into your system. The capsules will dissolve. And then the powder will be absorbed by your intestine and your body. And then the drug can circulate. And then you can get the benefit of the drug. Is that okay? The promise of God is the capsule for the power of God. The power of God is the powder that is inside. The promise of God is that capsule. You must have a revelation of that promise. Before you can connect to the power that it carries. There is a difference between just quoting the Bible. Reciting mentally. Many people are quoting scripture dryly. If there is any English like that. He knows the scripture. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall, he just recite it. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. He just recite it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He's just reciting it. But he does not have a revelation of that promise. One prayer that I will pray for you tonight is that from tonight, your revelation of the promises of God will begin to change. You will have a revelation of the promises of God. Because until you begin to have the revelation of the promises of God, your prayer cannot be effective your prayer cannot be accurate because you can't connect to the power of God. So, the rep, let me tell you, somebody that read Psalm 23 is different from somebody that wrote Psalm 23. They are different. Yes or no? The person that read it, just read it, is different from the person that wrote it. The person that read it may be good in reciting it mentally. Mentally. He just said, sometimes he doesn't even know the meaning of the heaviness of the words that that psalm contained. He just said, but the person that wrote it has a revelation of what he wrote. You can't be writing what you don't understand. He knew, he knew that psalm. He knew the, he knew the God of the psalm. And but the person that is reading it, just read the letter of the psalm. So the two of them are different. From today, I want to pray for you that you will have a revelation of the promises of God so that you can connect to the power of God. So, I'm saying the revelation of the promises of God in the scripture determines three things. Number one, it determines the legitimacy of your request. When you have a revelation of God's promise, you will be able to know which request is legitimate 
and which request is not legitimate. It determines the legitimacy of your request. Many people are asking things that are not legitimate because they don't have the revelation of the promise of God. So the revelation of the promise of God will determine, number one, the legitimacy of your request. How legitimate is your request? So that you won't be asking for something that is wrong. You should be asking for something that is right. And you cannot know what is right until you understand the promises of God concerning that thing. So the first thing that the revelation of the, of the promises of God in the scripture does for you is it determines the legitimacy of your request. Number two, it determines the scope of your prayers. The scope of your prayers. How far your prayer can reach. How, how extended your prayer can be. To what length and breadth can your prayer cover? When you have a revelation of the promise of God, you will know the areas that your prayer can cover. Every area covered by the promises of God, your prayer can cover. But the area that the promise of God didn't cover, your prayer cannot cover. Did you get what I'm saying now? So when you have the revelation of the promise of God, Number one, it will determine the legitimacy of your request. Number two, it will determine the scope of your prayers. The scope of your prayers. And then number three, it will determine the assurance of answers. The assurance of answers. If God promised something and your request is in line with his promise, you are sure of the answer. Did you get what I just said? If God promised something and your request is in line with what he promised, you can be assured that he will answer. So when you have a revelation of God's promise, you have, you have an assurance of answer. God will not promise what he will not give. When you know what he promises, one, you will know what requests are legitimate Two, you will know the scope of your prayers. Three, you will have assurance of answers. The three together will contribute to prayer accuracy and effectiveness. Did you get what I'm saying tonight? Praise God. So, it, it, this principle is correct. Either you are asking for forgiveness of sin or you are asking for victory. Whatever you are asking for. It is principle that must guide your prayer. As a practice, I don't just go into prayer. I search, I understand the, the promises of God. So that I can find out, is my request legitimate? I can find out how far can my prayer go? Which areas will, can my prayer touch effectively? And then I can be sure that God will answer my prayer. Because once I'm asking for something that is not in line with his promise, I cannot guarantee the answer. Is that okay? Praise God. So tonight, we are looking specifically at praying accurately for the forgiveness of sin by standing on the promises of God. By standing on the promises of God. So let me tell you four things about the promises of God. So that you, your prayer accuracy can, can be increased tonight and can become stronger. I want to pray for you. Never again, you will never pray amiss. Your prayer will be accurate. Your prayers will be effective. And your prayer will provoke answer from heaven. In Jesus' name. So, number one thing about the promise of God. The promises of God in the Bible are the divine invitation to practically experience and manifest our div No, the promises of God in the Bible, the first one. The promises of God in the Bible give us the awareness of the richness of God's pantry. And the nature of divine offers. 
That's the first one that I want you to know. The promises of God in the Bible gives us the awareness of the richness of God's pantry and the nature of divine offers. How do you know how rich the pantry of God is? How do you know the nature of divine offers? Look at the promises of God. I will explain that. The promises of God in the Bible give us the awareness of the richness of God's pantry and the nature of divine offers. Did you get that now? How many of you have pantry in your house? Pantry is where you keep your food. Hello, somebody? Pantry is where you keep your food. Even if it is under your bed. That's your pantry. <laughs> because some people keep their food under their bed. Maybe they are afraid somebody will come and take it. <laughs> or whatever. But pantry is the place where you keep your food. And some of you will still build more houses. Those of you that have built before, you will still build another one. So the next one you are going to build, you must create a special place for your pantry. That's where you put your food, your yam, your rice, your gari, your semo, your pupuru. Tell me what. Praise God. Your beans, whatever. Everything you eat, you put it there. Your palm oil, everything. Your granite oil, your pepper, everything is there in the pantry. Did you get that now? When you step into your pantry and you see all kinds of food that can last you for two months, how restful do you become? Talk to me. How restful do you become? Will you be at rest? Or you will still be agitated? Hello. We look at the food. Different. You are sure that the next two months, oh, I can go to sleep. I don't need to. The issue is, the issue is what do you want to eat? The issue is not how can we get what to eat now? You see, it's rich. There is yam there. There is all kinds of food that there. You have rest of mind. At least for the next two months. Do you know that God has pantry in heaven? That is what guarantee that he will supply everything you are asking for. Are you getting what I'm saying now? But can you travel to heaven to go and find out how rich the pantry of God is? So that you can know what you are going to ask for. How do you know the richness of God's pantry? Because once you travel to heaven, you won't come back again. And I'm not sure you are ready to go now. So there must be something that will give us an awareness of the richness of God's pantry and the nature of divine offers. Divine offers are things that God can give you, not government offers. The prime ministership of Egypt was given as a divine offer to Joseph. The queenship, the queenship in Shushan, the palace, was given as a divine offer to Esther. Not that she merited it, not that she had the money or the connection for it. There are many things that God gives people, not because of anything, but because it was just an offer from heaven. Are you getting what I'm saying now? And many of us have experienced such offers. So how do you know that the pantry of God in heaven is rich? How do you know the nature of his offer? You look at his promises. Hello somebody. When you open the scriptures and you see the variety of the promises of God, it will give you an awareness of the richness of God's pantry and the nature of divine offers. So, you will be able to pray with boldness. Knowing well that what you are asking for is covered by the provisions of the promise. Is that okay now? Beloved, can I tell you something? There is nothing you will ever ask for that the pantry of God will not supply. The pantry of God is richer than the treasury of America. There is no country treasury that can stand the pantry of heaven. America can stand today and say we will destroy the world. They can say that. 
that statement is not an empty statement. It is coming from the sophistication of their treasury. They have the weaponry, they have the money to prosecute any battle against any nation and deal with them. The whole nations of the world together, America will crush everybody. That's why they call them as the superpower. The most powerful nation on earth. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Most of the superpowers don't, they don't, they can't, they, they only align with them. They don't mess up with them. Nigeria cannot wake up and say we can destroy the world. Can we say that? If any leader in this country said that, he should go to a psychiatric hospital. So, because we can't destroy Ghana. In fact, we can't tackle South Africa. Now talk of the world. Why? Because we have a very lean treasury. Our pantry is very scarce. But can I tell you today, the pantry of God is richer than the treasure of all the world, all the nations of the world put together. You get what I'm saying? The Bible says, and God is able to do exceeding abundantly above what you ask or even think. Are you get what I'm saying now? Whatever you're asking for, you can do in excess. Why? His pantry is rich and his divine offers are un unexplainable. How do you know how rich the pantry of God is? You know some people wear, wear big clothes but they don't have penny in their pockets. Maybe they even borrow the cloth. You know some people borrow cloth, they borrow shoe, they borrow car. When you from head to toe, it's borrow, borrow. But they will create a false impression that they are rich. But people that sit down and say, ah, this is a rich man. They will, they will be disappointed that they are, they are even richer than them. And you get what I'm saying now. But let me tell you. How do you know how rich the pantry of God is? How do you know the nature of divine offers? You look at the promise of God. Read it again. The promises of God in the Bible gives us the awareness of the richness of God's pantry and the nature of divine offers. That is a revelation of the promise that you must have that will help your prayer accuracy and prayer effectiveness. Either you are praying for forgiveness of sin or you are praying for anything you are praying for. Did you get that? Number two, the promises of God in the Bible are the divine invitation. The promises of God in the Bible are the divine invitations to practically experience and manifest our divine heritage on one hand and to practically disconnect from the limitations of our natural heritage on the other hand I have said two things the promises of God in the Bible are the divine invitations to practically experience and manifest our divine heritage on one hand and to practically disconnect from the limitation of our natural heritage on the other hand. Every human being had two different kinds of heritage. We have a natural heritage which is limited, restricted, manipulated by the devil. You can't fulfill your destiny on the strength of your natural heritage. Because your natural heritage is going to program you to live a limited life. There are many things in your natural heritage that is under the control of the devil. Are you following what I'm saying now? There are many things you will never be able to do if you are functioning from your natural heritage. So as far as our natural heritage is concerned, there are limitations. Somebody say limitations. Somebody say limitations. Your natural heritage will make you live a limited life. Because the devil can handle your natural heritage. You can't fulfill destiny based on your natural heritage. 
But when you become born again, when you give your life to Jesus, that is a divine heritage. And you get what I'm saying now? That gives you access to unlimited life. That's why the Bible says, if any man is in Christ, is a what? A new creature. Heritage has changed. All things have passed away. All things have become new. There are many things that you will not be able to do under the natural heritage that you will be able to do under the divine heritage. Paul the Apostle said, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. When you are reading the Bible, you must know the scriptures talking about your divine heritage. And you must know it differently from natural heritage. Is that okay? Tell somebody you are created for more. Okay, tell yourself, I am created for more. Say it again, I am created for more. The awareness that you are created for more comes through your divine heritage, not your natural heritage. Many of us by natural heritage were already limited. There are little things we can do. In fact, there are some things we cannot do. There are some people in their natural heritage that they don't live long in their family. So once they are 50, scarcely would they get to 60, they will die. And when they look at seven generations, they discover that all of them is between 50, 55, 60, they die. And it has become a curse, a limitation of the natural heritage. But when you become born again, you can cross over from that natural heritage to the divine heritage. The Bible says, with long life, I will satisfy you and I will show you my salvation. That's the provision of your divine heritage. Hello, somebody. Why do I have to explain this? Because I want you to understand the promises of God. Now, look at it again now. The promises of God in the Bible are the what? Divine invitations to practically experience and manifest our what? Divine heritage. On one hand, and to practically what? Disconnect from the limitation of our natural heritage on the other hand. Did you get that now? Every time you open the Bible and you read the promises of God, what is God doing? He's inviting you to cross over. Cross over from natural heritage to divine heritage. Natural heritage has limitation. Divine heritage has no limitation. Crossover. Somebody say crossover. How many of you have you remember when Jesus was walking on the water? Are you with me tonight? Hello? Hello? You remember? When Jesus was walking on the water, it was around 4 a.m. So, and you can imagine how dark it will still be on the seaside at that time. So, he was coming to a disciple. And he was walking on water. And then the disciples saw the figure of something walking on water. They thought it was a ghost. And naturally, they were what? They were what? They were afraid. And Jesus told them, no, don't be afraid. It's me. And one of them had the audacity. Peter by name said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come. And Jesus said, come. That's an invitation. That's an invitation. Come. 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 He's simply saying, look, you can do what I'm doing. What I'm doing is not natural. But I'm inviting you to cross over from the natural to the supernatural. On the strength of that invitation, Peter stepped out of the boat and he was walking on the water doing the same thing that Jesus was doing. The natural heritage was suspended. The divine heritage took over because he was invited. Come. Are you getting what I'm saying now? 
And as he kept his face on Jesus, he was walking on water. Walking on water. Something that nobody has ever done apart from Jesus. His father's father didn't do that. The other disciples in the boat, if all of them had responded to that same invitation, they would do the same thing. But they couldn't respond. So they couldn't experience that possibility. Up to today, it can be written in the account of Peter that he walked on water. It couldn't be written in the account of any other disciple. So Peter kept walking on water. Just exactly like if it was on land. And at a point, his natural heritage took over. He looked at the beatings of the waves. He took his eyes away from Jesus. And then the natural heritage took over again. He began to sink. Because in the natural level, nobody can walk on water. It's not possible. He began to sink. And then he shouted, Save me, Lord. And Jesus reached forth to him and saved him. And together, they still walk back <laughs> on the water. He said, come. And then Peter responded to that invitation. Beloved, look at me. The promises of God are the divine invitation to cross over from the limitation of your natural heritage to the possibilities of your divine heritage. Did you get that, beloved? Every time you read the promises of God, you are being divinely invited to practically experience and manifest your divine heritage on one hand and to practically disconnect from the limitation of your natural heritage on the other hand. Hello, somebody. This truth will give you a revelation of the promises of God. One of the promises of God is that I shall not die, but live and declare the works of God. Beyond what is the cause in my ancestry. Maybe they die young. Beyond the doctor's report. Maybe the doctor said there is no way. But the promise of God, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of God, is the invitation of God. And say, look, you can cross over the doctor's report. You can cross over the course in your ancestry. You can experience and manifest your divine heritage. And then you can disconnect from the limitation of your natural heritage. Every time you see the promise of God, as a divine invitation, you will embrace it. How many of you understand this truth will help you? Because what people are doing, they are just quoting the promises, just, they are just quoting dry promises in the head. They don't have a revelation of what the promise is. You either take the invitation or you reject the invitation. But I want you to take the invitation. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Surely goodness and mercy are following me all the days of my life. That's a divine invitation. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. That's a divine invitation. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saying, that's a divine invitation to cross over from the natural to the divine and live a life that is not limited. Praise God. Did you get that? When you know the promise of God like that, it will help your prayer accuracy. Either you're asking for forgiveness of sin or anything you're asking for. Number three, the promises of God in the Bible reveal that our destiny and relationship with God cannot be held to ransom. Or frustrated by the negative consequences of our natural depravity and failure. The promises of God in the Bible reveal that our destiny and relationship with God cannot be held to ransom 
or frustrated by the negative consequences of our natural depravity and failure. When man fell from the garden of Eden, we lost certain things. Naturally, we become depraved. And naturally, we began to fail. Before the fall, failure was not a reality. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Failure was not a reality. There is nothing like depravity. Our body was sound. Our soul was sound. Our spirit was sound. There is no degeneration. There is no decay in our nature. But when we fell from grace, the Bible says all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When we fell from grace, we become naturally depraved. The negative consequence of that fall is our depravity and our failure. From that time, destiny has been frustrated. The devil has been holding the destiny of many people to ransom. The devil has been holding the relationship of many people to ransom. But you know what? Jesus came. That's the good news. Tell somebody the good news. Jesus came. He died for our sins. He paid the price. He rose up. Are you getting what I'm saying now? So we have another alternative. So the promises of God in the Bible reveal that our destiny and relationship with God cannot be held to ransom or frustrated by the negative of our natural depravity and failure. Tell somebody I am, I can, I am unstoppable. That's who you are. I am unstoppable. God is simply saying with every promise that he gives you that look, your destiny cannot be held to ransom. Your destiny cannot be frustrated. That's what the promises of God does for us. That's what the promises of God, that's what he's doing for us. Every time you hold the promise of God, the promise of God is saying, look, the negative consequence of your natural depravity and failure cannot hold you to ransom. Did you hear that? That your destiny cannot be frustrated. Your relationship with God cannot be frustrated. Where others are limited, you become unlimited. The promise of God is just what is telling you that. Except you choose to be limited. The promise of God is telling you, look, you cannot be limited. You can take your destiny to the levels of God. You can take your destiny to the levels of God's design. You can take your relationship with God to a higher level. That is what the promise of God is telling us. That the negative consequence of our failure and our natural depravity cannot stop us. Hello, somebody. Somebody says, standing on the promises. Every time you stand on the promise of God, you pray accurately, pray effectively, you are unstoppable, you cannot fail because the promises cannot fail because the promiser cannot fail. Did you get that now? If he promise, he can't fail because he is, he is faithful and he cannot fail. So his promises cannot fail. So you, that you are standing on that promises, you cannot fail. Your destiny cannot be held to ransom. Your relationship with God cannot be frustrated. In spite of the reality of the natural depravity and failure, we are living in a world that is naturally depraved and a world that is prone to failure. But Standing on the promises of God tells you you can rise above the depravity. You can rise above the failure. Hello, somebody. 
Other people may be failing around you. They may not stand on the promise of God. You are not supposed to fail. And you cannot fail because others are failing. You just be sure of what you are standing on. If you are standing on the promise of God, what you are being told is that, look, your relationship with God, your destiny cannot be frustrated. Did you get that now? Praise God. When you have that understanding about the promise of God, it will help your prayer accuracy and your prayer effectiveness, whatever you're asking God for. Number four now. The promises of God in the Bible introduce us to the superior alternative available for us in God. The promises of God in the Bible introduce us to the superior alternative available for us in God. That's a very simple statement. We have an alternative in God. You, as a believer, you cannot be stranded. As a believer, you have options. You are not a person of one option. You have wider options. How many of you remember one year God gave us wider options? You remember that word that year? Just like we are from glory to glory this year. That year that is wider option. Somebody say wider option. You have a wider option. To have a wider option means I cannot be restricted. I am not limited to only one option. Nothing can stop me. Are you getting what I'm saying now? That's what the promise of God does for us. The promise of God in the Bible introduced us to the superior alternative available for us in God. There is a superior alternative. Hello, somebody. There is a superior alternative available for us in God. The other people in the world or believers that are not standing on the promise of God may be limited by the option, options in the world. But we cannot be limited because there is an alternative. Somebody say alternative. Somebody say alternative. Somebody say alternative. Now, if you want to go to Lagos today, you have alternative. Am I correct? You can choose to pass through Akure, Elisha, Ibadan, Lagos. Or you choose to go through Akure, Ondo, Ore. Jebode, Lagos. Yes or no? You will still get to Lagos. Nothing must say that you have to go through one route. You have an alternative. Hello, somebody? And there are places that there are seven different alternatives that you can pass to get to the same place. So everybody can choose. Okay, I'm not going this way. I'm going this way. I'm going this way. So, the issue of I'm stranded does not occur. The same thing in life. Hello? The promises of God introduce us to the superior alternative that is available in God. Let me give you an example. Life is the superior alternative for death that is in, that is in the world. There is life in God. There is death in the world. Light is the superior alternative in God in place of darkness which is the option in the world. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life. Redemption is the superior alternative in God in place of the consequence of the fall of man. Forgiveness and pardon is the superior alternative in God in place of the guilt and condemnation of sin. I can go on and on. Tell somebody I have a superior alternative. In God. 
Say it again. I have a superior alternative. In God. Now, let me give you an example. Most of the people that have problem with the miraculous promise of God, quite a number of doctors and health personnel always have problem to step into the miraculous. The nurses, the doctors, and all the people in the health circle, they always have problem, challenges to believe God for the impossible, especially as it relates to health. Why? Take doctors, for example. They have been trained from the first day in medical school to the last day how cancer develops. Are you with me now? They have all the medical facts. They will tell them this is stage one, stage two, stage. By the time these two more get to this stage four, the person must die. There is no medical cure. Hello? That's what their teachers tell them in the medical school. All the years they spend, they have ingrained that fact into their mind. But what the medical, what the teacher failed to teach them, that's why their education is not complete. Is that, look, this thing is not possible for medicine. But it is possible with God. Hello? So when somebody is in stage 4 cancer, and he says he's believing God for intervention, a medical doctor will just laugh. Hello? He will just laugh. He will say, this guy is going to die. <laughs> this guy, because he knows the fact. He knows the fact. But the truth he doesn't know is that medicine can't handle it. But God can handle it. Look up. How do we know that God can handle it? Luke 137 said, with God. How many things? Did he say except cancer? Huh? He said, all things are what? Are possible. Mark 9.23 said, all things are possible to him that believeth. Hello, somebody. So, most of the health personnel they have problem believing God for healing because the fact that they know has become part of their thinking that they cannot accept the truth of God. Beloved, there is a superior alternative. Hello, somebody. How many of you agree with what I'm saying tonight? There is a superior alternative in God. When people are dying, life is your superior alternative. I shall not die, but live. When people are in darkness, the glory of the Lord shall be risen upon you. That's why the Bible says, Arise and shine, for the light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. You see, darkness covered the earth, and utter darkness covered the people, but the glory of God shall be risen upon you. That's your superior alternative. So you cannot be stopped or stranded. You have a superior alternative. How do you know? The promise of God. Introduce you to that. Hello somebody now. Nigeria may be having problem with the economy. A lot of people are in hunger. But you know by the promises of God that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Are you get what I'm saying now? The Lord will give grace and glory. And nothing will be withheld from those that walk uprightly. The young lion suffer lack and they get hungry. But they that seek the Lord will not lack any good thing. My God shall supply your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And so on and so forth. Hello somebody. Every time you open the Bible... And you look at the promise of God. You are being introduced into the superior authority that is in God. I am not a man of a single option. 
I am a man of wider option. How wide are my options? As wide as the promises of God. Hello. As wide as the promises of God. As wide as the promises of God. As wide as the promises of God. So the promises of God are your divine plug to assess the abundant life that is available in God. I'm just explaining that number four. The promises of God are your divine plug to assess the abundant life that is available in God. Now, maybe your bat the battery of your phone is, is discharging and you want to charge. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? You go and plug it. You plug it into the socket and then the current in the socket will flow through and charge your battery. Listen to me. The promises of God are your divine plug to assess the abundant life that is available in God. In the world, we have limited life, restricted life. In God, abundant life. Which one do you want? The limited life or the abundant life? Some of you don't look like you want the abundant life. <laughs> do you want the abundant life? Which one do you want? So, your plug, your divine plug into that abundant life are the promises of God. Are you hearing me now? When you get home, I want you to go and sing that song, standing on the promises of Christ, my King. La, 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 I, I can't remember the lyrics. La, 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 standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of Christ my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. I read something about Abraham in Romans chapter 4 when Paul was talking about him. Paul said he staggered not at the promises of God. He staggered not at the promises of God. So if he didn't stagger, what was he doing? He was standing. Did you hear what I'm saying tonight? I, I wish you understand my heart tonight. Many of us are staggering on the promise of God. That's why we are not connecting to the abundant life in God. That's why the devil is stopping us. That's why your prayer is not accurate. That's why your prayer is not effective. But from tonight, stop staggering. Stand standing on the promises of God. It does not matter what is happening. What you can have is what the promises contain. Did you hear? What you can have. What is possible. What can be real. What is available. Is what the promises contain. Not what you see in the world. Not what people say. Not what governments say. What the promises contain. Look at this. Romans 4.20. You see that? He staggered not at what? The promise of God. Through what? Through unbelief. So every time we are doubting the promises of God, what are we doing? We are staggering. Have you seen a drunkard before? How do drunkards, how do they work? They stagger. They stagger. When a drunkard is staggering, a small child can just push him. And he will fall. Because it's not stable. But the Bible says, he staggered not at the promise of God. Through what? Through unbelief. Unbelief will make you stagger. Faith will make you stand on the promises of God. What you see 
may be contrary. But don't stagger. Stand. Tell somebody stand. Stand on that promises. Don't listen to what people are saying. Don't listen to what government is saying. Once God promises it, stand on that promise. Don't stagger. That is the miracle. That is the, that is the secret of Abraham's miracle. Okay? He staggered now the promise of God through unbelief, but was what? Strong in faith. Giving glory to God. He was standing on the promises. Standing. Is there somebody tonight who will begin to stand on the promises? Many of us are, live, are standing on our certificate. The confidence you bring to life is a function of your certificate. You will soon learn that that is not safe. Only God knows how many certificates are wasting away. For the promise of God will connect you to the abundant life that is available in God. Did you get that now? You know why I gave all this truth? You can't find this truth anywhere in the world. They are truth that the Holy Ghost communicated to me. And I found them to be true. These are truth that will give you a revelation about the promise of God. Hello? Once you have a revelation of the promise of God, your prayer, either for forgiveness or for anything, will be accurate and what? Effective. Hello, somebody. That's the point I'm hammering on. I want you to understand that. When you have a revelation of the promise of God, your prayer will be accurate, will be effective. Because you have a handle to hold on to God and to demand the manifestation of his faithfulness. Irrespective of what is happening around, you will keep standing on the promise of God. Hello? Therefore, whatever you choose to do with the promises of God in the Bible, determine the accuracy and effectiveness of your prayer on any issue you are praying for. Whatever you choose to do with the promises of God in the Bible, determine the accuracy and the effectiveness of your prayer on anything you are praying for. That is why it is very important to do the following with the promises of God. I tell you eight things that you must do with the promises of God. If your prayer will be accurate and if your prayer will be effective. Number one, search for the promises of God that covers your request. Search for the promises of God that covers your request. Before you pray, search for the promises of God that covers your request. That's the first thing you do. Search. Tell somebody, search. Say it again, search. Don't just depend on the promises of God that they are telling you. Search the Bible for yourself. Especially the promises of God that cover what you want to pray for. For example, you want to pray for forgiveness of sin. Hello? And you feel that your sin has been so terrible. You feel that God cannot forgive me because I have been a terrible sinner. That's not the issue. The issue is, is there any promise in the Bible that God will forgive a sinner that repents? If there is, it doesn't matter how terrible the sin is. Search for the promise. You want to pray for protection? Search for the promise of God that cover your request. That is the beginning of praying accurately. Search for the promise. Tell somebody, search for the promise. That's the first thing you do with the promise. Because many, many believers today are not doing anything with the promise of God. Unfortunately, it's just hearing the promise. It's not doing anything. The first thing you do with the promise of God, search for the promise of God. Number two, 
Read the promises of God. Read the promises of God. Read the promises of God. Stop listening to men. Stop listening to the harassment of men. Stop listening to the intimidation of, the, of nature. Stop listening to the pain of, to the, to the symptoms of your pain. Start reading the promise of God. Read it. Tell somebody, read it. That's the second thing you do with the promise of God. Read the promise of God. Number three, know and understand the promises of God. Know and understand the promises of God. Know it and understand it. That's what you do with the promise of God. When you know it and understand it, you will know what to pray for and what not to pray for. And then it will help you to pray right. Number four, believe the promises of God. That's what you do with it. The promise you know and the promise you understand, you must believe. Believe the promises of God. Number five, confess the promises of God. Confess the promises of God. In fact, it is when you confess the promise of God that reveal that you believe it. If you don't confess it, you don't believe it. Confess the promises of God. Number six, am I right? Insist on the promises of God in the face of contrary situation. Insist. That's where many people fail. Situations are contrary. Insist on the promise of God. The situation says you can't get something. The promise of God says you can have it. Insist on the promise of God. Touch somebody and say, insist on the promise of God. Insist. Say it again. Insist on the promise of God. Say it again. Insist. Insist on the promise of God. Listen to me. Has somebody come to your house before? Maybe he's coming for the first time. And then you prepare something for the person to eat. And you say, come and come to the table. I've prepared something for you. And the person says, ah, no, 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 no. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then you say, I insist. Hello? How many of you have experienced something like that before? You say, ah, ah, no, I don't want to eat. Say, I insist. Ah, uh ah, -uh, you must eat. Uh, this is the first time you are insist. Maybe somebody wants to give you something. I say, ah, don't worry, don't worry. He said, no, I insist. Hello? Can somebody insist on the promise of God? Hello? For your life. What is the issue currently in your life? That the devil is using to intimidate you. What is the promise of God over that issue? Can you insist on it? That in spite of what devil is saying, in spite of what people are saying, in spite of what the situation around me is saying, I insist. That is the number six things that you do with the promise of God. Insist. Number seven, fight with the promises of God. Many of us are fighting with abuses. You are fighting with hatred. You are fighting with talking, 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 talking. That's the fight you will always lose. At that level, the devil will always defeat you. Take the fight away from the zone of the devil. Is that okay? Anytime the eagle wants to fight the snake, it doesn't fight the snake on the ground. Did you get what I'm saying now? He uses his claw to catch the snake. And he takes the snake to the sky. And then he deal with the snake. The sky is the zone of the ego. The land is the zone of the snake. The devil is that snake. Take away your fight away from his own. By entering the promise of God. If you are looking at their circumstances. That's the zone of the devil. He will always defeat you. Hello. How many of you are hearing what I'm saying now? Huh? If you are looking at what is happening, you are looking at how you feel in your body. You are looking at what the doctor say. You are looking at what people say. You are looking at the history in your family. That's the zone of the devil. He will always defeat you. Take it away from that. 
and get into the zone of God. That's how you fight with your promises. Don't use malice as instrument. You can never be malicious as the devil. He will beat you in that level. Don't, don't use gossip. Don't use hatred. That's not your instrument. Fight with the promise. Tell somebody, say, fight with the promise. Fight with the promise. Don't allow the promise of God to lie fallow. Fight with it. Fight with the promise of God. Fight the devil with it. Fight lies with it. Fight men with it. Fight demons with it. Fighting with the promises of God is called the fight of faith. The do here. Fighting with the promise of God is called the fight of faith. Your sight is saying something different. But the promise of God is saying something else. And you choose to fight with the promise of God. That's the fight of faith. Can I tell you something about the fight of faith? It is a good fight. You know what Paul said? I fought the good fight of faith. Every other fight is a bad fight. But the fight of faith is a good fight. Fight with the promises of God. Fight with the promises of God. And number eight, experience the fulfillment of the promises of God. Experience the fulfillment of the promises of God. Hello. You see the journey now. The last one is experience the fulfillment. That's where some people want to start from. Want to experience the fulfillment. Where will you throw number one to seven? Hello? You know number eight can never happen until number one to seven happens. Did you get that? People want to experience the fulfillment of the promise of God. But they don't even search for that promise. They don't even read the promise. They don't know and understand the promise. They don't even believe the promise. They have not, never confessed the promise. They don't even insist on the promise. They are not fighting with the promises. That's why it is not possible for them to experience the promises. And that's why their prayer will not be effective. Their prayer will not be accurate. They praise God. Having said that about the promise of God, therefore, when it comes to praying accurately for the forgiveness of sin, you know, this one now we are dealing with the forgiveness of sin. I've given you the general principle that you can use for anything, but we are dealing with the forgiveness of sin now. So when it comes to praying accurately for the forgiveness of sin, the best thing to do is to stand on the promises of God. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debt. As we forgive our debtors. Want to ask God to forgive your sin? Stand on the promise of God. Because I give you reasons. And then we pray. When you are praying accurately. To pray accurately for the forgiveness of sin. And beyond that for anything anyway. But we are dealing with forgiveness of sin. The best thing to do is to stand on the promises of God. Why? Number one, because God's word is full of his promises of mercy and forgiveness. God's word is full of his promises of mercy and forgiveness. That's why you can ask for forgiveness. You get what I'm saying now? That's why you can ask for forgiveness. God's word is full. Either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, the word of God is full of his promises of mercy and forgiveness. Let me show you some promises of the word of God. Praise God. So it doesn't matter how terrible your sin has been. 
you can receive forgiveness. Not because you deserve it, but because the word of God is full of the promises of mercy and what? And forgiveness. Did you get what I'm saying now? Somebody said, I've aborted several times. Ah, I've done terrible things. Ah, am I sure God is going to forgive me? Oh, he will forgive you. If you ask for it. Not because you deserve it. But because his word is full of his promises of mercy and forgiveness. Hello. If it is in the promise of God to forgive the extent of your sin notwithstanding. The depth of your sin notwithstanding. In fact, the devil has deceived some people to believe that, look, you, God can never forgive you. I was talking to a young man. He was always falling back, falling back, falling back, falling back. At a point, I asked him. I said, what is wrong with you? He said, sir, with, with what I have done, I don't believe God can forgive me. That's the lie that the devil is telling him. Listen to me. God will forgive. Why? Not because you deserve it, but because his word, either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, is full of his promises of mercy and forgiveness. When you step into the supermarket of God, Forgiveness of sin is one of the items. It is available if you ask for it. Let me show you an example in the Bible. Not all, but few examples. Look at Isaiah chapter 55. I won't explain, but just take note of it. Isaiah chapter 55. I'm reading from verse 6 and 7. Isaiah 55 verses 6 and 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call that's when it is not too late. Call ye upon him while he is near. Verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. And he will have what? Mercy upon him and to our God. For he will what? abundantly pardon. Did you get that? How many of you remember when I said that there is no sin that can exhaust the grace of God? You hear now? Even in the Old Testament they say, he will abundantly pardon. That's a promise. Look at Proverbs chapter 28. I will read verses 13 and 14. Proverbs chapter 28 verses 13 and 14. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have what? Mercy. The Bible says shall. Somebody say shall. Which means nothing can change it. Shall have mercy. Verse 14. Happy is the man that feareth always. But he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. Look at Acts chapter 5. This is in the New Testament now. Acts of the Apostle chapter 5. I'm reading verses 30 and 31. Verses 30 and 31. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom ye slew and hung on a tree. Him had God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and what? And forgiveness of sin. Look at Acts chapter 13. I'm reading verses 38 and 39. Acts chapter 13 verses 38 and 39. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe. How many? 
all that believe are what? Are justified from how many things? From all things. From you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Look at Acts chapter 26. I'm going to read verse 18. Acts chapter 26. I'll read verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive what? Forgiveness of sin and beyond that an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Are you following me? These are the promises of scripture. You know, the Bible says in the mouth of one or two witnesses. But this is more than one or two. <laughs> so the truth is established. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm reading verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1. I read verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. The what? The forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. Somebody said my sin is very bad. The Bible says his grace is very rich. That's what I read for you. Oh, my sin is terrible. Ah, pastor, <laughs> if you hear what I've done, what have you done? Are you the devil himself? Even if the devil himself come, the riches of his grace will handle him. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Now? Read it again. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, not according to what we deserve. Not according to what we merit. But according to the what? Riches of his grace. Are you hearing me now? Write down 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. You can bring it up for me on the screen. And then write down Hebrew chapter 10. Verses 16 and 17. When I'm through with 1 John 1 9, you can bring up Hebrew 10, 16, and 17. Look at 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sin, is what? Is faithful, faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Whatever tells you that God will not forgive you when you confess is telling you that God is not faithful. He's saying that God is not just. Beloved, do you agree that God is not faithful? Do you agree that God is not just? Is he faithful? Is he just? So when you ask for forgiveness, he will give you. Give me Hebrews chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts. And in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I what? Will I remember no more? Many of us are still struggling with the condemnation of the past. This is the promise of God. God was not joking when he was making this promise. And their sins and iniquity will I remember no more. So, when you want to pray accurately for forgiveness of sin, the best thing is to stand on the promise of God. Because, number one, you remember, God's word is full of his promises of mercy and forgiveness. Because, number two, the promises of God for pardon is on the condition of repentance from all sins. That's number two. The promises of God for pardon is on the condition of repentance from all sin. Once you repent, forgiveness is sure. Number three, because 
the greatest spiritual need of man is forgiveness. And it is already guaranteed in the promises of God. The greatest spiritual need of man is forgiveness. And it is already guaranteed in the promises of God. That's why you should stand on that promise. That's why you should stand on that promise. You will soon understand why you must be accurate in your prayer for forgiveness of sin. And you must be sure you have received forgiveness. It is because you will need freedom to grow and develop in Christ. You will need a complete breakaway from the guilt of your sin of the past to develop with speed in grace and in God. As long as the devil has a way of deceiving you that your sins are not forgiven, your growth in Christ will be stunted. You will remain under the guilt of sin and the condemnation of Satan. Number four, it is better to stand on the promises of God so as to pray accurately for the forgiveness of sin because the promise of God for forgiveness involves the three things. The promise of God for forgiveness involves three things. How many of you agree with me that the promise of God for forgiveness, I mean the forgiveness of God is different from the forgiveness of man. You will soon know. When God says, I forgive you, do you know it's different from when man says, I forgive you? Hello? Did you get? You know many times man will say, I forgive you. And in reality, they have not forgiven. Huh? How many of you understand what I'm saying? When man says, I forgive you, but really has not forgiven you. How do I know? You say, please, sir, please say, I've forgiven you, I've forgiven you. Don't worry, let's forget it, I've forgiven you. The next time when you do it, when you commit another mistake, you will refer to it. You say, hey. you say I'm just looking at you. <laughs> you, see, you see. Hey, that's how you did. That's how you did. That's especially between husband and wife. Ah, if it is the woman, the woman, that, that's how you used to do. November 20, 1969. <laughs> That's how you did. April 7, 1972. That's how you did. You no know, women have some terrible memory. They remember everything. You can never change. But you said you forgave him. Why are you remembering again? Praise God. And then some men also do that. <sighs> I, for, I, I, I just said I forgive because I know you do it again. And then he will begin to say everything again. You think he has, he did, he, let me tell you, the forgiveness of God is different. Why? Because it involves three things. Number one, it involves the cancellation of the sinner's debt. The can, when God says, I forgive you, he has canceled your debt. The cancellation of the sinner's debt. Matthew 6 12. Forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. I told you last week that sin is a moral and spiritual debt. You remember? So the forgiveness of God, number one, involves the cancellation of the sinner's debt. When your debt are Cancel. Are you still a debtor? No. That's the first thing. Number two, the forgiveness of God involves the remover of the penalty of sin. The remover of the penalty of sin. Once the debt is canceled, the punishment or the penalty for that sin is what? removed. So when God says, I forgive you, he has removed the penalty for that sin. 
Number three, the forgiveness of God involves the triumph over the power of all sin. Triumph over the power of all sin. Which means no sin will have power over you. You will triumph over the power of all sin. Praise God. You see what it means, what forgiveness of God involves. The promises of God for the forgiveness of God. Praise God. That's what it involves. Many people have a wrong belief. They read about Paul and say, hey, Paul has a lot of problems. How many of you agree with me that Paul, when he was preaching the gospel, they would stone him, they would beat him. He has a lot of problem persecution. And somebody said, ah, why, won't he, why won't he have problem? Shebi was doing the same thing before he became born again. Uh, there is no, it, it is what he did that God is paying. How many of you have heard that before? That's wrong. That's not the God of the Bible. Are you hearing me now? It is not because Paul used to persecute people before. That's why he now experienced persecution when he's born again. It's not because he was part of stoning people before. That's why they stoned him. If that is the reason, then it means God is not faithful. And then it means God is still holding his sin against him. Listen to me. Either he was persecuting before or he was not persecuting before. Anybody that is standing for God on the earth will experience persecution. Is that okay? So don't ever believe that well. Ah, in fact, some people will say, I shake my hand. 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 That's a lie. That is error. The day he gave his life to Jesus, God has canceled his death. God has removed the penalty for that sin. God does not remember again. It is normal for the devil to rise in persecution against anybody preaching the gospel. The Bible says, all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus must suffer persecution. It's not only Paul. And it is not because God is trying to pay him back. Did you hear what I'm saying now? When God says, I've forgiven you, he's no longer referring to it. Praise God. Let me say this last one before we pray. Stand on the promises of God to pray accurately for the forgiveness of sin. Because, number five, when the believer assess the promise of forgiveness by faith in the atonement of Christ, the following will happen. When the believer assess the promises of forgiveness, not because he deserves it, not because of his fasting, not because of his prayer, but because of his faith in the atonement of Jesus. Is that okay? There is nothing that qualifies us for forgiveness except our faith in the atonement of Christ. So when the believer assess the promise of forgiveness, by what? By faith. Somebody say by faith. In the atonement of Christ. Not because of your performance. Not because you fasted. Not because you paid tight. But because you release your faith in the atonement of Christ. The following things will happen. Number one. He is no longer under the guilt and condemnation of sin. Once you receive forgiveness... Because you believe the death and the resurrection of Jesus. You are no longer under the guilt and condemnation of sin. That's the first thing that will happen. Number two. 
He is no longer under the power, the control, and the dominion of sin. He is no longer under the power, the control, and the dominion of sin. You are no longer under the power, the control, and the dominion of sin. Number three, he is no longer destined to go to hell. Once you receive the promise of forgiveness by faith in the atonement of Christ, he is no longer destined to go to hell. He is no longer destined to go to hell. Number four, the eternal judge has declared him pardoned, justified, and righteous. Once you assess the forgiveness in Christ through the promise of Christ, through the atonement of Christ, the eternal judge has declared you pardoned, justified, and righteous. Is that okay? You are no longer a sinner. The eternal judge has declared him pardoned Justified and righteous. Number five. The eternal judge has become his heavenly father. The eternal judge has become his heavenly father. And the spirit of God bears witness with his spirit that he's a child of God. And the spirit of God bears witness with his spirit that he's a child of God. Once you assess the promises of Christ for forgiveness, the eternal judge has become your father. And the spirit of God bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. Number six, the experience of forgiveness produces the joy of salvation. The experience of forgiveness produces the joy of salvation which fill his heart with love and gratitude to God. Which fill his heart with love and gratitude to God. The experience of forgiveness produces the... When you remember that God has forgiven you, what happened? There is joy of salvation. And this joy of salvation Fill your heart with love and gratitude. Beloved, I will say one more and then we we'll pray. Let me say this at this junction. When you remember that God has forgiven you, joy of salvation will fill your heart. This joy of salvation will fill your heart with love. And gratitude to God. Hello? Hello? When you receive the love of God, it will be easy for you to give the love of God to another person. Did you get that? If you have not received the love of God, you can't possibly give the love of God to another person. I'm going to round up on this because I'm going to pick up on the last point that I'm going to mention shortly next week. But I need you to understand this point. Because many of us or many believers today find it very difficult to forgive other people. You know why it is difficult for them? Because they themselves don't have a revelation of the love of God. Hello. When you see a believer saying, I will never forgive him. Ah, ah, <laughs> not in this world. Ah, if you know what he has done to me, I will never forgive him. Listen to me. That person does not have the revelation of the love of God. That's why he's finding it difficult to forgive another person. But listen, when you receive the forgiveness of God, that forgiveness will produce the joy of salvation. And the joy of salvation will do what? 
will fill your heart with love and gratitude. Let me give an example. You owe somebody one million dollars. I didn't say one million naira. I said one million dollars. And you have been owing that person for about ten years. Are you listening to me? And you have been promising, please, I will pay, please, I will pay, please, I will pay for ten years. So, and it is obvious you have not paid. And the person gave you the last chance. And he called you, this is 8.05. And he called you and said, by 9 a.m. tomorrow, you must bring my one million dollars. Otherwise, you will go to jail. What you have not been able to pay for 10 years? What miracle will happen between now and tomorrow morning? Obviously, you can never pay. And then 9 a.m., you went to his office. And you knock. And he said, yes, you came in. And he said, where's my money? And you fell on the ground. Please, sir. I don't have. Please. I don't have. And he looked at you. And he had mercy on you. And he said, I forgive you. I write that debt off. Don't pay again. You are free. What will happen to your heart? Joy or sadness? Answer me, everybody. What will happen to your neck? Your neck will somehow be free of the body. You will, you will breathe deeply. <sighs> you fall down. In appreciation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Ah, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And you leave that office and you are going in town and you saw a fellow brother that owe you 10,000 naira. 10,000 naira. And you hold him. And you say, where is my money? And he said, please, please, please. If truly you are not a devil, if truly you are not a devil, and you know the meaning of one million dollars that has been forgiven you and written off, what should you do immediately? In fact, the love and the joy that is, you say, ah, bro. Go, go. I forgive you. <laughs> you, you are forgiving somebody with $10,000. naira, Because you have received forgiveness from $1 million. Listen to me. But it take a devil to say, you must pay me. And he said, please, please give me, please give me more. He said, you pay. And then and then you carry him, you throw him in jail. The person that forgave you one million dollars, when he had, what will he do? He will revisit his case. Lock you up and say, until you pay. Matthew 6, 12. We are going home now. And I want you to understand that. And forgive us our what? And forgive us our as we forgive our debtors. Look at 14. Give me 14. Verse 14. Let's read together. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. Verse 15. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly father forgive your trespasses. Let me make the last point and there we go. He or she is eager such believer that has received forgiveness of God he is eager to extend the love and mercy received to all who have any contact with him. He is eager. He is eager. You get what I'm saying now? O Kalara is eager. 
tie your tie your talk on talk on he is eager to extend love and mercy received to all who have any contact with him. When you understand the love of God and you know how much God has forgiven you, you will not have problem forgiving another person. But if you choose not to forgive another person because you don't have the revelation of the love of God. God will choose not to forgive you no matter how much you pray. Are you blessed tonight? Are you blessed? Is it worth your coming? There are two prayers we are going to pray tonight. Let's rise up and ask you. There are two prayers we pray tonight as we go if you are truly a child of God, you are born again, you have received the forgiveness of God. Tonight is the night of thanksgiving. Hello? Only God knows the weight of your sin. Only Jesus Christ can know. You don't know the weight of your sin because you are not the one that carried the depth of that sin. The person that carried it is the one that knows the weight of your sin. And who is the person that carried it? Jesus Christ. It is through him that we receive forgiveness. Are you following me, beloved? So tonight, if you are born again, if you are a child of God, tonight is the night that you should worship him. Thank him for forgiving you. Is it worth it? Thank him for forgiving you. The truth is that by his forgiveness, he cancels your debt. He removes the punishment. And it deliver you from the power of sin. Tonight, let's worship him. Number two. If you have not been born again. If you are not born again. Tonight again, God is extending his love to you. Don't let me assume that everybody is born again. Let me, under this anointing, tell you the good news is that it doesn't matter your sin. You can receive his love and his mercy. If you confess those sins and you repent, God will give you a new beginning. So if you want to give your life to Jesus, tonight is a night you must never miss. Confess your sins and ask him to forgive you. As simple as that because the promise of God guaranteed that. And he will forgive you and you will begin a new life. But for those of us who are born again, it is another night to thank him. Father, I thank you for the work of my salvation. Thank you for forgiving my sin. Thank you for carrying the depth of my sin away. Thank you for the love of God. And beyond thanking God, I want you to ask that God, would, you will receive a higher revelation of his love. And as from today, you will not hold anybody again on their sin. You will forgive everybody, no matter whatever they have done to you. So whichever group you belong to, you can go ahead and begin to pray to the Lord tonight. Not quiet prayer. If you are in the first group, thank him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank him for the promise of forgiveness. If not for that, where will I be? I give you praise. I give you glory. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness. Thank you for forgiving me my sin. Thank you for the mercy of Christ. Thank you for the love of God. Thank you because my debt is cancelled. Thank you because the penalty is removed. Thank you because I am free from guilt and condemnation. Blessed, O oh Lord, be your holy name. I receive a greater revelation of your love. Tonight, I choose to forgive everybody that has done anything against me. Because you love me. 
I will not hold anybody down in my heart. I release everybody in my heart because of the joy of forgiveness. And if you are not born again tonight, you can give your life to Jesus. Ask him to forgive you no matter the sin. He will wash you clean tonight. The provision has been made by Jesus. Assess that provision by faith. 